My name is uh, Alex. I'm one of the pastors here. If you are new today, and I have the privilege of uh, bringing a teaching for this series called Paradox. And we've been looking at the paradoxical teachings of Jesus, and we've had some great teachings, haven't we? I think Pastor Marx, Pastor Harris in the last few weeks were really, really great teachings. You can watch them online. Uh, and today we're going to dive into a subject that is uh, a little emotional for some, and it's a little tricky to address. And so um, before I read the verse, I'm going to just tell you, don't, don't shoot the messenger. Um, we're going to be talking about generosity. So let's go to Luke chapter 6, verse 38, and it says this. Give, everybody say give, and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. It's a paradox from Jesus. And the title of this message is Unleash Your Generosity. Raise your hand if uh, you're a hoarder. Uh, anybody, just me? No? Okay. That's fine. I'm just making a confession here like always. I like to hoard things. I like to take a hold of things and just put them in my closet and in my backpack or in my suitcase and, and never let go of them. And so I accumulate things for years. But my wife is more of a cleaner. She likes things neat and she likes to get rid of all the old things that we don't use anymore. And so now she's getting into the, this whole Marie Kondo method. Those of you who've seen her on Netflix, um, uh, you know, I'm, I curse her, but some people like her, you know, so it's okay. And the whole method is about cleaning up your space and whatever doesn't bring you joy, you let go of. And so uh, recently my wife was cleaning uh, our closet and she was basically going through all the things that, that don't bring joy anymore. And I'm going, this whole cleaning thing never brings me joy. So I want out. And there was a t-shirt that I pulled up that had my name on it, and I, I told her that I wanted to keep it because it was, it was given to me in high school and it had my name printed on it. Now, in high school, I was just a few pounds lighter. Um, I was probably an M, if not an S, size. Don't judge me. This is just how life is. It's very natural. And so I pulled up the t-shirt and I said, can I keep this because it has my name on it? And she's like, no, you can't keep it. And I said, why not? And she said it. She actually said it. She said, because it don't fit no more. You know, thank God for vows in marriage. That through thick and thin, you know, we stay close together. So the reality is, it, I tried it. I actually tried it on, and I realized that she wasn't wrong. Because I put it on, and before it said Alex, but as soon as I put it on, it just said Alex. She was completely right. She, she's always uh, pushing against this tendency that I have of hoarding things. And I think this comes because this is what the culture teaches you. The world teaches you that you need to be accumulating and accumulating and accumulating. Uh, and, and, and then there are people that develop even pathologies because of all this accumulation. In fact, uh, there's a pathology that they've discovered, uh, which is called compulsive hoarding. Anybody here have it? Just me. And the reason for that is, I think, we're constantly thinking and dreaming about accumulating because that's what the world teaches us. But I want to propose to you this morning that perhaps God didn't create us to accumulate. I'm not saying that having things is wrong. I'm not saying that having aspirations or goals to attain certain things is wrong. What I'm saying is, I don't think that God created us to accumulate. I think he created us to be generous. I think there's, a, there's a, a, a generosity that is part of who we are because we are made in the image of God. We are the imago Dei. And because we are made in the image of God, there are aspects of his personality and of his character that are put in our hearts and in our lives that we can grow into and that we can discover as we follow Jesus, as we take steps with him. And one of the things that we can see is his generosity. You see, Jesus gave his only son to die for you and me. And, and his son is his most valued treasure. Just like for me and my kids. I have two little ones. As most of you know, I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. And sometimes they get on my nerves. But I love them all the time. And here's the reality. And you may judge me for saying this. I would not give them up for anybody on this planet. But God did that. Can you imagine? The, the level of generosity in our Father that he gave his son for you and me. And he did so because Jesus needed to die for our sins and cleanse our sins with his death and resurrection. And for Jesus to go through all that, it takes a very generous God. 
And so, as a church, we are able to reflect that. Now, I'm not, I'm not teaching this message with any level or hint of guilt whatsoever. Because here's what we've seen in the last few years of our churches. This is a very generous church. Mosaic Church is very generous. A lot of people ask all the time, how is it that a church uh, in the inner city is able to do all the things that Mosaic is doing? And the reason is we have a very generous family. So some of you might be thinking, well, if we are already generous, then why are we talking about all this? And the reason is, number one, because Jesus talks about it and is one of his paradoxes. And secondly, because what we want to do is throw gasoline on that fire. Because you see, the, the church is known for some things in this world and in this country. But I often wonder if we weren't able to speak and if we weren't able to show any kind of literature, what would the people in this country say that the church is about, that Christians are about? Are we about the things that we believe in? Are we about our political positions? Are we about our generosity? Are we about our faith and our hope and our love? And I think that this whole church in this part of the world, we could grow in that. Now, some of you are already uncomfortable. Some of you are thinking, why did I have to come today? Out of all the days that I, that I could have taken off, I didn't take this one off because the pastor is talking about money. If this is you, then let me help you compartmentalize a little bit. If you're uncomfortable talking about giving and generosity, then think about it in terms of how you relate to the rest of the world. There are needs in this community. There are needs in this city. There are needs in this state. And the church could be an answer for that. In fact, Arkansas is one of the, the, the poorest con- uh, states in this whole country. And I think the church could be a response to that and to all the consequences that take place from that. So please indulge me for the next few minutes as I go through this teaching. Uh, and if you're uncomfortable with that, don't think about it in terms of ministry. Think, think about it in terms of community impact and what you can do with the people around you. For those of us who call Mosaic Church our home, we can, we can connect this with our ministry and how we can continue to grow in what God has called us to do. See, that verse that we read at the very beginning, give and you will receive. It's a verse that I wish I could, I wish I could rewrite. Because if I were to use that verse and give you the Alex version, it would read differently. So let me show you the way that it would read. If it was just my version, I would give you a different cause for your reward. I would say, be good and you will receive. Do good things. And the more good things you do, the more blessing you will receive. But that's not what Jesus is saying. I would probably just show you another one. Be famous. Nobody wants to accept it, but especially millennials. We want to be known. We want the recognition. We want the renown. Often without putting in all the work that it takes to receive recognition. And we think that the more you are known, the more blessing you would receive. But this is not what Jesus is saying. For a lot of people, it's not about renown. It's about knowing. Know a lot. Be, be growing in your theology all the time or be growing in any... In, now, I'm not saying that education is wrong. All I'm saying is what Jesus is saying is it's not about the knowledge that you have that will allow you to reap a reward. And here's, here's another one that especially for those of us who, make, who are uh, Christ followers and go to church, for some of us is attendance. Attend everything that you can and you will receive. Attend on Easter. Attend on Christmas. Go to every prayer meeting and every gathering that the church has, and there will be a blessing. Is that what Jesus is saying? That's just what Alex is saying. But here's what Jesus is saying. Give, and you will receive. See, this is a sermon about a sermon. Because we are referencing the Sermon on the Mount. This is when Jesus was speaking on a hillside, and he was giving the most amazing sermon of all time which we see in the Gospels, and we see in the book of Matthew, starting chapter 5, and we see right here in the book of Luke. And when we combine both, we're able to see the things that Jesus was saying, and that he actually did mention giving and generosity throughout the sermon. So I invite you to read that at home if you can, and especially if you did pick up the Lexio Divina uh, flyer that we gave you a few weeks ago and figure out how to read the Bible and get from the Bible, then I invite you to use this with the Sermon on the Mount. But in this sermon, Jesus mentions generosity in many ways, and he allows us to understand how we need to grow in our generosity. And so what I want to do is I want to combine both sermons and go to Matthew 6 for a moment. Matthew 6, verses 2 and 4. And see what else Jesus says about generosity. He says this. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do. 
blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the, re the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. See, I think, I think God puts a priority on private generosity. And oftentimes, as humans, when we are generous, and when we give not just of our resources, but when we give of our time, when we give of our talent, when we volunteer, when we lend things out, Oftentimes we do it because of the recognition that that is going to receive. And oftentimes the world wants to give that recognition. But what I'm seeing here in that same sermon is that Jesus is prioritizing private generosity. And the way that I want us to understand and learn this is by remembering that we have to let our generosity flourish in private. We have to let our generosity flourish in private. Without boasting, without getting any kind of recognition of your generosity. Why would God do that? Why would he prioritize private generosity over any other kind of generosity? You see, I think it, it, it's because when you are giving in private, you have much less control of what happens with the object of your generosity. In other words, I think when you, when you give in private, and this is something my wife and I were talking about yesterday, when you give in private, you, you, you are basically giving onto the unknown. You're releasing something, and you may or may not have an idea of what's going to happen with that one thing. You see, when we give, especially in the church, we say, I'm only going to give um, if, it's, if, if I know what's going to happen with this money. But what I see in the Word of God is that though we need to be good stewards of the resources we receive, we're not to be good stewards of the resources that we give to someone else to steward over. See, we're not going to be held accountable for the fact that if I give a car away to uh, my brother or my sister, that they're going to use it to deal drugs. I'm going to be held accountable by the fact that I gave and that I was able to grow in my generosity. There's an issue of control, and I think part of the reason God wants us to grow in this aspect of generosity is so that we can let go of that control. See, it's, it's easy to remain in control. We often want to remain in control of the things that happen around us and the things that we do and the things that we give away. But this control has to be completely let go because when you let go of that control, you're allowing God space for him to work and to lead you into the unknown. And it may be better, in fact, I'm, I am willing to bet that it will be better than taking any step towards any plans that you have designed for your own life. In other words, could it be that God's plan for your life is better than your own plan? Could it be that if I were to say to God, Lord, here's what I want you to do with my life. This is what needs to happen in one year and in three years and in five years and in ten years. You're welcome, God. I did all the thinking for you. If you need me, I'll be here in Little Rock. Or could it be that God wants us to come in as children and say, Dad, have it. Take me. Do. Do. I release it. Some of us have issues of control. And some of us need to understand that God is wanting us to give that control. The Bible is filled with stories of people who had to let go of control. For example, Abraham, who was called to a land that he didn't know. Now, Abraham uh, was a wealthy person. And he was able to take some of the resources that he had onto the land where he was supposed to go to. But the origin of those resources was in the land of Ur. He was leaving the source of that to be obedient to what God wanted him to do. And God gave him a promise. And the promise is, you will be a father to many nations. And has that promise been fulfilled? Yes. And that's how God works. When we're able to let go of that control. I can think of Many stories like this, and like I said, this church is very generous, and we're always hearing stories like this, but one of those stories is the story of uh, somebody who's, who's been able to uh, support us financially. And I won't tell you their name because they want to remain private, but for my wife and I to come here uh, to serve in Little Rock at Mosaic Church, we had to raise support. We had to raise our salary like you do in most uh, uh, nonprofits. And after three years, this church grew enough to capture not just my salary, but that of three or four other people as well. And, and on top of that, do many things in the community. But back when I was uh, beginning this journey, I remember that uh, they told me, you have to go and raise support. And I thought, I don't, want to, I don't want to ask people for money. I mean, who likes to do that? 
So I just prayed and said, God, whatever you want to do, just open the door. And without asking, a friend from our family said, Alex, how much do you need to go to Mosaic Church? I said, well, this much a year for three years. And on the spot, he said, can I write you a check? And he kept writing that check up until this day. By now, this church, and I'm being completely honest, has captured my salary. So I don't necessarily have to raise support anymore. But this man, who's only been here two times in the last three and a half years, continues to give. And so he and I were having a conversation last year, because I see him often, lives in another state. And I was asking him, don't you, don't you I mean, that's, that's an amount. You know, this, this, is not a, this is not 10 bucks you're giving. And so he said, you know, I give what God calls me to give. And I can't stop giving because he won't stop the source of my giving. See, he is somebody who gives not just to Mosaic Church, he gives to two or three other organizations, and then on top of that, he gives in his community. And he says that every year for him has been great. Now, here's what I don't want to sell you. Some of you are thinking, uh, here we go into prosperity gospel. I just, I just knew that Alex looked like one of those. <laughs> if I was teaching a prosperity gospel type of message, then I would say, um, he, get, bring it here, right here, so I can put it in my pocket. Um, whatever you can, give it all, and then you will receive something this week or tomorrow. And then on top of that, you will never have any more pain. You will never have any more problems. You will never have any more suffering because you're giving. And if you do get some level of suffering, then uh, it's because you're not giving enough. That, that would be me right here on the prosperity gospel preaching type. This is not what I'm saying. You did not hear that from my lips. Here's what you're hearing from my lips. God is calling us to be generous regardless. And Jesus says, given you will receive, but the receive, he, he doesn't necessarily define the manner of the receiving. He defines the amount of the receiving. But the receiving can be for some people resources, but for other people it can be in relationships. For other people it can be in spiritual growth. For other people it can be in opportunities. But for all of us, what are we doing? We are building a house in eternity where we're going. That we're putting our eyes in what is unseen. We are investing where our investment won't rot and won't die. We're putting our eyes in heaven. And so regardless of whether we receive anything here or not, we're saying, Jesus, I will give. And guess what? You give, and he says, you will receive. So there, there is a receiving. I remember I was in a, a, at a church uh, a few years ago where a similar message had been taught, and I got a call during the week, and it was a man that was completely irate. And he said, where's my check? And I said, what do you mean, check? And he said, well, the pastor was preaching on Sunday that you give and you, I give and I will receive, so I'm waiting for my check. <laughs> and oftentimes, we think that it's, it's kind of like a give and take. Let me, just, let me just set your minds at ease. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that we're worthy of. There's absolutely nothing that you can send God a bill for. There's absolutely nothing that you can say, Jesus, I deserve this in my life, so please send it my way. Everything we get from him is because of grace. Amen? Now, he says in the same sermon, the Sermon of the Mount, that generosity tends to reveal something about our hearts. And he says in the book of Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, where he says, Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. I think the way that we need to understand this is that whatever is the object of our, genera- or our resources and our giving is really our first priority. If you look at your checkbook, if you look at the things that you possess, if you look at your credit card balance, if you look anywhere else that has to do with the resources that you have in hand, what are they going to fulfill? What do, what do they reveal about your heart? I think generosity allows us to switch our priorities. I think generosity allows us to understand that we don't necessarily have to focus our minds on the things that we want to get. And hear me again. I said at the beginning, I'm going to say it right now. It's not wrong to have things. So you didn't hear Alex saying otherwise. But what I'm saying is that they... Whatever we have in hand should not be our priority. There's a, there's a story by the comedian Kevin Hart. Anybody knows Kevin Hart? 
and he's a great comedian, and he tells a story that when he was beginning as a comedian, he needed resources from his mother, and she did something to reveal his priorities, and he says that it's because she's a very religious person. And so we got Kevin Hart via satellite live right now onto Mosaic Church from a YouTube video. So let's watch this together. Uh, when I needed an apartment and I went and got one on my own, I couldn't afford to rent because I was trying to do comedy. So my mom, she was very religious. She said, look, Kevin, I'm going to put you on my back. I got you for a year. You can go out, do what you want to do. I'm going to support you. After that, if you don't find a way to feed yourself, then you got to go, you got to go back to school. You got to do something productive. I said, mom, okay, give me a year doing this comedy. So my mom was very over religious. She was always, always telling me to pray, read my Bible. Um, I need rent money. It's come time for rent money. I'm like, Mom, you didn't give me rent this month. She's like, well, did you read your Bible? I'm like, Mom, look, I don't have time to talk about the Bible and stuff right now. I need the money. Like, this is for real. They're going to kick me out. She's like, read your Bible, then talk to me. Mom, okay, goodbye. I hang up with my mom. I ain't going to do this. Another month go by, I'm getting eviction notices. Mom, stop playing. Like, if you don't give me this money, I'm going to be homeless. Did you read your Bible? Mom, I, I don't want to read the Bible right now. I'm, I'm not going to have a place to read it in a minute if you don't give me the money. Right. She's like, look, I'm not going to do this with you, Kevin. Read your Bible. Talk to me. It gets close to the third month. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, they're really threatening to kick me out. I finally opened up my Bible. When I opened it up, my mom put all of the checks for the rest of the year in the Bible. Amazing. So I open it, and all of my rent checks fall out. And I just sat there with the dumbest look on my face. <laughs> Call my mom. I said, Mom, I see what you did. You put it in the Bible. She said, did you read it? No, but I got the checks. <laughs> Anybody want to check out my Bible? Because they ain't got no checks. But it reveals priorities, right? It reveals that his priority was something else. His mom kept pushing him towards that, and she was teaching him a lesson that really ought to teach us a lesson too. And I think the lesson, Jesus spelled it out. This is why this is the best sermon ever. If you ever get bored at a sermon, just go home and read the Sermon on the Mountain, and that will make up for whatever boring sermon we teach you. But in Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 33, he says something really important. He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Can we read it together at the count of three? One, two, three. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. What is he saying? He is saying... Whatever you want to pursue, make that a second or a third or a fourth priority. The first thing you need to do is seek the kingdom of God. Amen? This is why I'm not giving you a prosperity gospel thing, because I'm telling you, this is about being in the presence of Jesus. This is about basking in the presence of Jesus, about understanding who he is and pursuing him with our whole lives and never letting go of that relationship, and that he will take care of whatever else. Uh, don't hear me saying... Don't, don't, don't grow in your, in your profession. Don't hear me saying education is bad. Don't hear me saying any of that. Just hear me saying none of those things should be your first priority. It should be second. It should be third. And it's important. And you have to provide for your family. You have to have a job. If you're, if you're single and you are dating somebody who doesn't have a job, leave them because they need to have a job. But that has to be second or third priority, y'all. And our first priority has to be seeking the face of God. I want to tell you how we, we experienced this. And this is just something that happened to me. I'm not saying it's going to happen to you. But I think there's a principle we can learn from it. Is in the time that we were between churches, which was uh, in 2015, and the Lord had asked us to step down from our previous ministry without knowing where we're going. And we wrestled with that for many, many, many months. And we brought a lot of people into prayer, and we brought it before uh, wise people in our lives for them to confirm what we we're getting from the Lord. And it was very scary because one of the stupidest things that you can do in this life is to leave one source of income and have none. So I stepped down from my previous ministry, and we still love those leaders. I just got to see them in South Florida a few weeks ago. Um, so it wasn't anything personal. It's just we felt the Lord was calling us to move forward. And here I was in my mid-30s with a one-year-old and my wife moving out of my house, figuring out what I was going to do, not knowing where our income was going to come from. And I was, man, on my knees every night because I just didn't know what he wanted to do and I didn't know how he was going to provide for us. And I, I began to do ministry throughout the region and 
and do other things. So it's not that I was completely idle, but I, I just knew that he wanted me focusing on uh, what I could do at whatever church would ask me to go and help out and also to figure out where he, he was going to take us next. So during that time, I remember praying with my wife about the fact that we needed resources, we needed money to get through, and little by little, we, we just had people that would, for one reason or another, give us a, a gift or a resource, but the, the best one, or the funniest one, really, God has a sense of humor. We got this letter in the mail from our mortgage lender saying that we were, we were allowed to be part of a class action suit because our bank had been sued, and we were entitled to $20,000. And all we had to do was sign on the dotted line. And I remember thinking, is this like a Nigerian prince type of thing? Like if I sign this and they're gonna send, I'm going to send some money. And so I called the bank and they said, no, it's for real. And we signed and we sent it. And then they sent us that check. And what did we use that check for? We used it for ministry and we used it to stay afloat. And, and the, that amount finished because we also try to bless other people, et cetera, et cetera. By the time that we got here, the last bit of that money was the week before I started getting paid at this church. So I'm not saying that if you're without a job that you're going to get a check from heaven. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the Lord has a way of showing you that he's behind you. He has a way of supporting. He has a way of, of if you're seeking him and you're seeking him first, he has a way of replenishing what has been lost. And you're making space, but you do it in a responsible way when he's calling you to do that by giving and being generous. And he, he gives it. Now, I, I'm not sure that that would ever happen to me ever again, maybe. I'm not sure that that would happen to you. What I am saying is expect that the promise will be true. Expect that he will actually reward. And expect that that is going to be built somewhere where we're going. See, I think uh, in that same verse in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, he uh, finishes by giving us a clue. And he says in this clue, the amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Let me read it again. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Now, he's not saying necessarily you've got to give it in a specific place, though we'll talk about that in a few minutes. He's just saying your, your responsibility is to be generous and to give. And the type of blessing and the amount of the blessing you receive is directly correlated to what you're giving. But it may be, like I said, a relational blessing. It may be a spiritual blessing. It will be an investment in the home we're building in heaven. We do it because he commands to be generous and to give. But he's saying the amount you give will determine the, the amount you get. I think that phrase is setting us on a journey. Because it gets us thinking, oh wait, so whatever I give has some sort of effect. The cost is my giving. The effect is my getting. But the, but the giving of whatever I am going to get is completely up to him. And whatever I receive, I will receive it with contentment, with joy, and I will take it as an opportunity to give glory to God. Why? Because whatever we get is not our priority. Our priority is to seek God. But the fact that he's saying this, I feel it's setting us on a journey because it sets me on a journey. It set me on a journey when I was 19 and I read these principles, and I was taught by uh, my leaders and my mentors that I needed to start being generous. Even then when I had, I was a poor college student and had no salary, and needed to start giving in whatever way possible and be generous. And it sent me on a journey of generosity. Now, anybody can go on this journey of generosity, but only, only people who decide to be one of two categories. And that is this. There are people who are givers, and there are people who are takers. Now, some of you are uncomfortable because I'm talking about this in terms in, in, in a church, and I'm relating it to ministry. Stop thinking about that for a second and think about your marriage. In every marriage, there are givers and there are takers. If you're getting an elbow right now to your ribs, you are the taker. In, a, in any friendship, there are givers and takers. At work, there are givers and takers. There are people who are constantly giving, and there are people who are wanting to build their career, and they're just taking, 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 taking without giving to anybody else. We have to choose to be known as givers rather than takers. In whatever area of life we are. And that if somebody were to say something about us, it would be that. In, in, in my son's classroom, apparently my wife and I are known as liars. 
Yes, and the reason is my son had a fight uh, with, the, with the boy in his class the other day because he was saying, your mommy and daddy are liars, your mommy and daddy are liars. And I said, Evan, why are they saying that we're liars? And he said, because I told him what you told me about Santa. And I said, what did I say about Santa? That he's not real. <laughs> are there any kids, by the way, here? <laughs> Cover their ears. <laughs> a little too late, right? Whoops. We just decided to tell our kids early that there's not going to be a dude coming in through the chimney, invading your house, and getting a restraining order. That's just not going to happen. We, we use it as a tale. It's something we say, this is a story we're telling and we're having fun with it. But so he decided to tell his, his friends that. And so now we are known for those people. We are those people. The Pharisees. There are givers and there are takers. You decide what you're known for. So what are you going to be known for? And, and it's not about like some people will say, well, I don't necessarily what people, I don't care what people think about me. But the reality is they do. And your life could be the best sermon that somebody else hears. Do you want to preach a sermon on taking or do you want to preach a sermon on giving? And for those of you who decide to go on to the giving side, there is a journey, a few steps of generosity. And this applies, again, not just to church, but think about it in terms of your impact with the community. Some of you are thinking right now, of course, I, I'm hearing this from the pastor, so he's thinking about the church. Well, if that makes you uncomfortable, th think about all the needs that are in our region. There are many needs in our region. There are people who are going hungry. There are people who um, are dying because of sickness that is not well treated. There are people who um, are orphans and they need, they need uh, parenting. There are people who uh, are, are just are, are needing help growing in their education and their finances. There's so much need in the city. There's so much need in, this, in the state that there's no excuse for us to say, I'm, I'm not giving. Because here's what I, what I usually challenge people with when they tell me, I don't, I don't like to give at the church because they're full of hypocrites. And then I go, well, where do you give? Because if that's your take on where you're giving, then you must not be a hypocrite and you probably give somewhere else. I know, I'm going to get an email on that one. <laughs> email it to harry at mosaicchurch.net. <laughs> and so I'm saying, if this makes you uncomfortable, then, then y'all go out there. If you walk a few yards out of this parking lot, you will bump into a need that needs resources and needs your generosity. If you, if you look on Facebook and just Google Arkansas Nonprofit, you will see other needs. There are so many needs that you have to be a part of. And so in whatever area of life you're growing in your generosity, here are the four steps that you're going to have. The first step, none, by the way, none of these steps are wrong. They're just steps. And the first step is that of a tipper. These, these, these are those of us who are just giving whatever's left. And it's not a bad step. It's just a step. But it's the beginning step. This is the way that we teach our children to give. If, if there is an event where they need to, they get the opportunity to give, we give them a little change for them to give. This is how my parents taught me to give when I was going to church as a little kid. They would give me a few coins and I would put them in the offering bucket. It's the principle of tipping. And we're in a culture that teaches us that that is the best way of giving is by tipping because we don't know what's going to happen with those resources. So some people are tippers, but there is a next step, and the next step is tithing. Tithing comes, of course, from the book of Malachi and the Old Testament where there's a commandment for the people of Israel to give 10% of their first fruits towards the house of the Lord. And so some people take the Old Testament principle and they apply it in their lives and they schedule their budget, their resources to go out in that way. They give 10%. Maybe it's not just their money. Maybe it's their time. Maybe some people say, I will volunteer 10% of my time to such and such organization. But then there's also a next step, which is an extravagant giver. These are people who give above and beyond. I think this is the step that the New Testament takes us towards. Because the, the New Testament, especially in that same sermon, remember this is a sermon about a sermon. And so in that sermon, Jesus redefines a few things. He redefines adultery, for example. And he says, adultery is not just uh, sleeping with somebody that you're not married to. It's lusting in your heart. So he takes it into a much deeper level. He, he, he talks, for example, about being accused of martyr. And he's saying, if you insult somebody in your heart, it's, it's like you have, been, you have murdered them. He takes it to a deeper level. And I feel that with generosity, he takes it to a, a grander level because he tells stories 
of people who give completely of themselves. And people who are not just extravagant givers and give a lot of who they are and what they have, but people who are legacy givers, who give so much that they will, that their ministry will be remembered forever. I think of the story that Jesus told of the lady that in silence approached the giving at the temple and she just gave a few coins and it was everything she had. And he compares that with the Pharisee that came in and he was very loud and said, I am giving all this money. But he was giving only a portion. And even though he probably gave more money than what she did in the economy of God, he was a tipper. She was a legacy giver. And so there are steps. There, there, there are steps that we can take. And there are people around you right now who are moving in that direction. And if you are thinking, well, I already do this in my life, Alex. I already give to my church. I already give to this or that organization. Then, then my suggestion to you, if you would indulge me, is to consider what is your next step? What is your next step of generosity or giving? Where are you going with that? Are you letting your generosity take you on a journey? Because this journey allows us to see what God can do with you when you allow that space. This is not an issue of sin, by the way. You will, you will not, if you're a tipper or a tither or extravagant giver, a legacy giver, it's not necessarily an issue, an issue of sin. It's an issue of obedience and taking a step and then taking another step. There are people who've taken these steps all the way to 100%. There are people who've taken these steps all the way to 90 or 80. I think of Rick Warren, for example, who wrote The Purpose Driven Life and made a lot of money off of that book, a lot of money. And he often teaches that he and his wife live off of 10% and they give away 90. I think, I think of John Wesley, a well-known preacher in, of the last few centuries. And John Wesley became so well-known that he, he started to receive all these resources and developed a discipline to live off of 2% of what he was making so he could give away the rest. I think those are the things that give glory to God. And I'm not saying we're expecting you to do that. I'm just saying struggle with the idea. Figure out what your next step is. Because I think generosity, at the end of the day, can be infectious. Generosity can be attractive. You want to be an attractive person to others? Then be generous with your time. Be generous with your talents. Be generous with your treasures and teach others about generosity. Become an example in, in, in your ability or opportunity to disciple other people and talk to them about what God is doing in your life or what God says in the Bible. Then encourage them to give. And then there, there are those of us who are part of this church. This is our home church. And for those of you that have made Mosaic Church your home, I tell you, first of all, thank you for your generosity. It's because of that that the, the Lord has been using all that to do so much in our church. And the reason we want to continue to do more things for the Lord is not so that we can be a big church. It's because we want heaven to be bigger. And we do so through the ministry that the Lord is giving all of us. Amen. And so those of you who are, have made Mosaic your home church, I, you've probably received a letter this morning from Pastor Harry. And the letter outlines um, the next giving needs for our church and so I invite you to please read that and please consider do I need to continue to invest in this work my wife and I do we love to invest in a work that has ripple effects in this community this church has I think increased so much the renown of the name of Jesus in this city in this community and even in this whole country that we just feel so much joy but even if none of those things were in place we still have to give and be generous and so the question for you is, what is your next step? I will finish with this. Yesterday, uh, Upward Soccer had its last game of the season. And Upward Soccer is led by our very own Paul Kroger, the director of Vine and Village. And so we're part of that. And at the end of my son's game, there was a mom that came and started giving all the kids treats, you know? And she was giving chips and gummies. And she's been doing that for the last few games. So I usually try and get to the huddle. I put my hand in a little bit, pulled out a little gummy bag, and because I did good by watching. 
And I realized yes, yesterday something that put most of us to shame is I think most of the families that were around that particular soccer field were Christ followers. But the lady who was giving away this stuff was not. She, she was clearly somebody of a different faith. And she outgave the Christ followers after that game. So I thanked her. And I'm so glad that the Lord put that in front of me to teach me something. But I think it also should teach us as a church that we are able to unleash our generosity and see so much change happen in our lives. Yes, we will get a reward. Yes, we will get something from the Lord. Yes, we're investing in our house in heaven, but the command is not for us to be watching for what we're going to receive. The command is for us to give and be generous. So my question to you is, what is your next step? If this teaching was uncomfortable for you, please see me or send me an email so we can talk. My email, once again, is harry at mosaicchurch. But if not, if this is something you're feeling convicted of, then please consider the letter we give you or consider other organizations in the area, and I can point you in the direction of many. Because every time that I've seen a believer unleash their generosity, I've seen a great work of God in their lives. Amen? Father, thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you for your words, not mine, Jesus. And thank you that you use us to accomplish your purposes. Not because we deserve it, but because we get to be a part of your movement. Thank you for being here this morning, for being alive. We pray these things in your holy and powerful name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Let's give God a big hand of praise for that word. Oh, come on. Give him a big hand of thanks for that word from Pastor Alex.